Our story begins on October 31st, 1760, in a city then called Edo, the largest city in the world at that time. Just across the river, from the very heart of the iron-fisted military regime known as the Tokugawa Shogunate, an unassuming child is born in the quiet, working-class quarter populated largely by merchants and artisans. That child would go on to forever alter the direction of Japanese art, sending shockwaves all the way to Western Europe. The improbable epicenter of a global artistic shift, a simple bookshop, where a 12-year-old Hokusai is sent to work to help provide for his family. At this bookshop, a young Hokusai would learn how to carve woodblocks used for printing the Japanese art of ukiyo -e. The world would never be the same again. This is the story of the life and art of Katsuchika Hokusai, a man whose imagination and drive to create was as unabating as the towering swell of foam-capped waves over the heads of terrified oarsmen. Hokusai was himself a force of nature, untamable in a period defined by constraint. Let's go back in time for a moment to Edo, Japan in the late 1700s. The government is stable and there's relative peace throughout the land, but this peace comes at a price. Strict social order is the rule of the day. No one is permitted to leave Japan and all contact with the outside world is limited to a single port in Nagasaki on a man-made island called Dejima, where Dutch merchant ships are permitted to visit twice a year. The Chinese merchants have slightly looser restrictions, being permitted to enter the port and do trade 10 times a year. The effect of over 150 years of isolationism, injected with tiny jabs of Chinese and Dutch literature and art, spawned one of the most unique creative cultural phenomenons in history. The most popular art style in Japan at that time was ukiyo-e, or pictures of the floating world. These pictures sought to capture the fleeting beauty of everyday life and for Hokusai, the power and majesty of nature. Hokusai was intrigued by European landscape paintings and began to experiment with a uniquely Japanese approach to landscapes. Ancient beliefs and traditions maintained their supremacy in 1700s Japan. Meanwhile, Europe was in the midst of the so-called Age of Enlightenment, tugging away the wild weeds of the old world in order to sow the seeds of the world we live in today. In Hokusai's world, nature still not only demanded respect, nature was itself divine. Manifestations of otherworldly power could break through into our world through trees, animals, people, or even a mountain like Mount Fuji. During Hokusai's time, an influential cult known as Fujiko devoted themselves to the veneration of the majestic peak that overlooked their city of Edo. They affectionately called this mountain Fujisan. There were three ways of expressing this devotion. One, climbing Mount Fuji. Two, viewing Mount Fuji from afar. And lastly, capturing the essence of Fujisan through art. Hokusai expressed his devotion to Fujisan in a now legendary project, 36 Views of Mount Fuji, which included one of the most memorable pieces of art ever created the Great Wave off Kanagawa. When these prints reached Europe, they caused a sensation and inspired not only artists like Monet, Manet, and Renoir, but also musicians like Claude Debussy, who in 1903 composed his magnum opus, La Mer, a musical evocation of the essence of the sea. Some would call it musical impressionism the musical equivalent to Van Gogh's Starry Night, or, perhaps more accurately, Hokusai's Great Wave, which Debussy chose as the cover art of his now legendary work of artistic genius. La Mer
What you're hearing is called harmony. Different notes seamlessly woven together, adding layers of depth, texture, and color to music. The song you're hearing dances gracefully through the air like a playful wave. Suddenly, a wave that exists only in your mind is born. It has a personality. It has its own view of the world around it. It plays an essential role in something much bigger than itself, bigger than the ocean that it dances upon. That wave in your mind is something like the Japanese idea of a kami. The kami is not the wave itself, but rather an otherworldly power that inhabits the wave. You know you're in the presence of a kami when you get that overwhelming feeling of awe or sublimity from nature. It may be in the form of an oddly shaped rock or an unusually tall tree or a waterfall that takes your breath away. These elements are serving as conductors of an interconnecting energy force between our world and Shinkai, or the world of the Kami. This spiritual concept is surprisingly very similar to the ancient Irish idea of the Dainashi, who reside in the Celtic other world. Kami exist in harmony with nature, and their interests lie in protecting that harmony. That is to say, Kami have little interest in making judgments on human morals or doling out favors to devotees, but rather demand respect. And if that respect is violated, will enact revenge or at the very least block blessings. The best way I came to understand the concept of Kami is in Akira Kurosawa's 1990 film, Dreams. In this clip, we see that the kami are directly connected to our world through the peach trees. The kami feel the sorrow of the vanished trees because as they describe it, they are the very spirit of the trees, the life of the blossoms. Without peach trees, there is no peach blossom, and without the peach blossom, nothing to celebrate, and therefore no reason to return to that family's home. This would spell ruin for the family, and they may spend the rest of their days trying to earn back the favor of the kami. Earlier, I mentioned the similarities between the Japanese idea of the kami with the Irish concept of the dainushi, also known as the fairy. The ancient Irish had a sincere reverence towards nature, and they carried a fear of upsetting otherworldly forces which inhabited their island long before them, and are believed by some to remain there to this very day. To get an idea of this view of nature, here's a clip from a 1966 interview with a particularly cautious Irishman. I'm a poor man, and I want money the worst way. And I'll tell you the truth, if you give me a thousand pound tomorrow morning, I wouldn't take a spit with a spade in it. Well, what about, what about the fairy field now, where they've changed it to? The fairy field and the rahin is all the same to me. I wouldn't meddle with it. And God between us and all harm, I'd don't want to see anyone around here meddling with it, that, with that enchanted place. So how does this view of nature come into play in Hokusai's work? Well, we don't have to look any further than Hokusai's most famous, 36 views of Mount Fuji. 
These prints show men living in harmony with nature, but also in awe of nature. And instead of celebrating man's conquest over nature, they tell a very different tale. One where nature may at any moment swell up in a powerful rage and cast the desires of mortals aside in order to exert its rightful place as the original inhabitant of this earthly realm. You see, Mount Fuji reigned over the Japanese landscape eons before there were humans to admire its majesty, and Hokusai understood that deeply. This is the difference between a simple landscape painting and a work of Hokusai. Landscape paintings simply capture what a human eye can see, while Hokusai could capture the magic that lies beyond human sight. The next time you see this image, remember that you're looking at more than a wave, more than a mountain. You're seeing the harmonious magic of nature in all its glory. The only thing us mortals can do in its presence is cling to our humble vessels in awe.